been talking about um, our goal, which is to move towards normal forms. And um, there's lots of different normal forms. The, the normal form that, that we care about in particular is the Jordan normal form. And the Jordan normal form is really nice in terms of exponentiating matrices, which is how we're going to be solving systems of, of differential equations. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce bases, and we're going to introduce a uh, change of basis um, procedures, because uh, that's sort of what we do to put a transformation into a nicer form, is we choose a basis in which the matrix for that transformation is very, very clean. And so that's all, it, at the end of the day, that's all the Jordan normal form is, is change, change basis in a special way that gives you a really nice, clean version of the transformation that you're looking at. So that's where we're headed. Um, but we just have a couple last little things I wanted to talk about as far as um, basic features of linear transformations. And so just sort of finish up the last couple of topics here. One special feature of uh, linear transformations is that they always take zero to zero. So linear transformations always take zero to zero. Uh, and this is pretty easy to see because we know that uh, L of zero is certainly equal to L of zero minus zero. And since linear transformations split over sums, we see that L of zero uh, minus zero is really L of zero minus L of zero. Anything minus itself gives us zero, right? So linear transformations then always take zero, the zero vector in one space is the zero vector in another space. And so this property here, um, we're going to use this to illustrate um, how something can fail to be a linear transformation. So let's, let's consider a non-example. And so this, you know, the reason I like this is because it, it looks pretty darn linear, right? I mean, if you graph either of these two component uh, functions, you can XY plane, they'd be lines. So it, it, it looks really linear, um, but it actually turns out to not be linear. Because we notice that, let's go ahead and plug in zero. We end up getting five in the first component and minus one in the second component. And since every linear transformation has to take zero to zero, that tells us automatically it fails to be linear. Uh, but it is close to being linear. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a cousin to a linear transformation. This is what's called an affine transformation. So what we'll do is we'll write this thing in matrix form to see its structure a little bit more clearly. Basically, it's a matrix um, 2 minus 3, 5 minus 3, times this column vector x, y, plus this column vector here, 5, negative 1.
And so, even though it's not a linear transformation, we see that it has a linear transformation at its heart, and it's just been shifted by some vector five negative one. Um, and so these are actually useful in linearizing systems of differential equations. You've got, you know, some uh, equilibrium point for a differential equation. You can linearize around that equilibrium point, and locally around that equilibrium point, it looks the the uh, the uh, trans the um, the vector field locally around that equilibrium point looks like. Um, the result of a, of a linear transformation. Um, but usually those equilibrium points are going to be away from the origin. And so this is what uh, you get if you had um, the linearization around the equilibrium. Um, is your vector field look, look like some linear transformation that's been shifted to, to live around that equilibrium point. So that's... Um, an affine transformation. And what you'll notice is that affine transformations are interesting because they're basically like a grown-up version of y equals mx plus b, right? Um, it's sort of like a grown-up version of y equals mx plus b where m is kind of your slope. It's like a slope matrix, quote-unquote. And then this vector here, it tells you your shift. So here's where we get to the really important stuff for this week. Where we're going to start discussing um, basis dimension span. So there's several different ways of characterizing what we mean when we say basis. Um, but this, this is uh, the way we're going to think about it. 
A basis is just a list of vectors that we can use to generate any other vector in our space as a sum of rescaled basis vectors. So any vector v can be written as a sum of uh, rescaled versions of these basis vectors, where that sum is unique. So the reason that we care so much about bases is because um, bases in linear transformation sort of go hand in hand, where um, given a linear transformation, if we want to study how it, how it behaves on vectors, the easiest way of describing it is write your input vector as a sum of basis vectors and look at how that matrix transforms the basis vectors. Um, and so we like bases because it's sort of a minimal set. It's, it's the least amount of information that we need in order to describe our space completely in a way that works well with linear transformations. Okay. So let me summarize that. So, yeah, we, we like bases to make the process of analyzing the key features of a linear transformation easier, right? You can, you can um, choose certain bases to make your transformation become uh, very clear. And it also gives you a way of computing um, how transformations behave in, in a very efficient manner, right? Matrix computations um, are, are very, very computationally efficient. Um, and that all starts with choosing a basis for your space. Okay. So um, we're we're gonna just do a couple of really simple examples um, that. You know, I know you've already seen before that um, are really just here to help build our intuition.
So everybody's seen this before. This is like everyone's favorite basis here, right? If you take uh, R2, you take um, 1, 0 out on the x-axis, 0, 1 on the y-axis, then uh, this is clearly um, a set that you can use to generate any other vector, right? So if we have a comma b, then we can clearly write a comma b as a sum of these vectors by taking a times 1, 0 and b times 0, 1. And so that first condition that any vector can be represented as a sum is definitely satisfied in this case, right? The second condition, that that sum has to be unique, that takes a little bit of work. But let's just suppose that we have a vector in which we have two different representations. A1 times 1, 0, plus B1 times 0, 1. Suppose that's equal to this vector. And suppose that we have another representation, A2 times 1, 0, plus B2 times 1, 0, uh, 0 1. Then, um, you know, if it's the same vector, then we can clearly set these equal to one another. So we'd get a1, 1, 0, plus b1, 0, 1, has to equal a2, 1, 0, plus b2, 0, 1. And so, um, this ends up telling us, uh, subtracting A2, uh, subtracting this term from both sides, and subtracting B1 from both sides. This ends up telling us that A1, 1, 0, minus A2, 1, 0, has to equal uh, B2, 0, 1, minus B1, 0, 1. Or in other words, a1 minus a2 comma 0 has to equal 0 comma b2 minus b1. And so you know, the other way a, a, a vector can be equal is if the components are equal. So what that says is that a1 minus a2 is 0, and b2 minus b1 is 0. And so just moving these terms to the other side, we get a1 is the same as a2, and b1 is the same as b2. So that tells us that any vector um, has a unique representation in terms of these two vectors. And so we've satisfied both conditions required for a basis. And so we see that that 1, 0, 0, 1 really are a basis for the xy plane. So, a uh, quick little definition that um, I avoided at first, um, just to not get bogged down in too much jargon. Um, a linear combination.
it's just any sum of rescaled vectors. So this is a linear combination of vectors v1 through vn. Given a set of vectors, v1 through vn, you know what's coming next. We call the span of v1 through vn the set of all linear combinations of those vectors. Another bit of jargon here, linear independence. Okay. So linear independence, um, really important um, feature in a, in a vector space. If you've got a set of non-zero vectors v1 through vn, then uh, they're linearly independent if whenever you take a sum equal to zero, a1, v1, a2, v2, a and vn equal to zero, it must be the case that the uh, coefficients are zero. Linearly, linearly independent vectors, um, if you take non-zero sums, then that sum always has to be non-zero. And we'll do some uh, geometric examples in a couple of minutes here. Um, So using these definitions here, we're actually going to introduce a second definition for what we mean when we say a basis, and it's completely equivalent to the first in the sense that, um, yeah, it's, it's completely equivalent to the first. We're just using a bit more jargon to say, okay? So a basis for a vector space. Here. 
So a basis is any collection of vectors v1 through vn. such that those vectors span the space, meaning every vector in that space has to be represented as a linear combination of these things. And such that V1 through Vn are linearly independent. So I realize that um, I haven't formally introduced the notion of a vector space. Just think of it as, when I say vector space, the collection of all the vectors that you care about, right? So it, it has a formal definition, but it's just all the vectors that you care about, right? So basis for, for your collection is any collection of vectors, v1 through vn, that spans the space that you care about and that's linear. And so that's really the same thing as saying what we said before, that um, you know, span is literally exactly what we said, that you can generate any vector as a, as a sum um, in a unique way. This linearly independent condition basically forces every representation of a vector in your space to be uniquely represented. And so this linear, linear independence is the same thing as saying that you have a unique representation. Okay. geometric examples of all these definitions. Um, let's go to consider a single vector. So I suppose we have V1 here. then clearly um, the span of V1 is going to be um, all constant multiples of this because we see that, okay, uh, the span is obtained by taking all linear combinations. Well, that just says take multiples of the vectors in your, in your set. <laughs> so that's just taking constant multiples of, of this vector, right? So, um, the span take all constant multiples of the same just going to be all vectors in the same line as v1. So this would be a2 times v1. So the span is just the line containing satisfies one of the conditions of a basis in the sense that V1 is certainly a uh, independent set, right? Because if we have A1 times V1 uh, times V1, how can we get that thing to equal zero? Well, this thing's non-zero, so the only way to get this thing equal to zero is, is if A1 has to be zero, right? So it certainly satisfies the linearly independent condition for a basis. Any other point 
there's absolutely no way that you can use this one little vector here to generate this point. And so even though it's a linearly independent set, it's not a basis for R2 because it fails the spanning condition. numbers and, and uh, things that we can actually compute with, it becomes a little bit harder to see some of the stuff. We're, we're thinking, we're sort of building intuition at this point. Um, and so, turns out these um, are going to be a, a basis for R2, okay? So, you'll notice that um, the span condition is really easy to see, because all we have to do is just use the parallelogram law if we want to generate this vector here. Just translate this vector until that runs into it. So we have that vector translated parallel to V1 and shrink it so that it's uh, short enough to where it matches up at that point. So this would be A2, V2. And then we see we'd also need to shrink V1. So we take A1, V1, shrink it down to this size, and A2, V2 to shrink V2 down to that size. And we've generated that point there. So clearly, the span condition is pretty easy to see. So it spans all of R2. The linear independence is, is hard to see geometrically. Um, and so the basic idea, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to do a very good picture proof of it, I don't think, but the, the linear independence um, basically amounts to, if you take linear combinations of those vectors, you're always going to get some new non-zero. So if you take non-zero linear combinations of those vectors, you're always going to get some new non-zero vector, basically because they point in different directions in this, in this particular case with R2. All you really need is for the vectors to point in different directions. And so, we're asking, you know, how can we take this V1 and V2, and how can we add these things? To get zero. And so, um, one way to think of this is that, you know, suppose you take some A1, V1, so here's A1, V1. Then, since V2 points in a different direction from V1, you'll notice that since A1, V1 is non-zero, and we're adding V2 to it, um, that, that points in a different direction, we can't kill off completely the length of this vector because as we're adding different rescalings of V2, since it's not in the same direction, we can't fill off the direction that V1 has. And so, like I said, I'm not going to do a very good picture proof of it, but you know, that's the basic gist of the idea, is that um, they don't lie in the same direction. So if you have A1, V1, then no matter what rescaling of V2 you have, you can't 
add those things to make them shrink all the way down to the zero vector, right? And so algebraically, it's, it's, it's much easier to do things algebraically to show linear independence than it is to see it geometrically. But that's the basic idea of kind of what linear independence means. No rescalings of those things will ever allow you to combine them to the zero vector because as you rescale one, you're pulling in this direction that you can't offset with the other. We have these three vectors, then we clearly have a spanning set, right? We take a span of these things. Then we can clearly generate any vector in this space because we don't even need V3 really. All we need is V1, V2. And notice that we can already generate everything in terms of V1, V2. So V3 is really just redundant here, right? So they satisfy that condition for being that basis, but you'll notice that they fail to be unique because we notice that uh, we, uh, we have uh, V1 equal to some, you know, we call it uh, V1, V1. Consequently, moving all these values to one side, we get a linear combination.